What is up, everybody? It is Alex from Heavy New York calling from the altar again, and this time we are here with Aaron Marshall of the Almighty Intervals. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, man. Of course. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's so awesome to have you here, man. The last time I saw you guys play, you killed it on the Spirit Box after the Burial Tour. That was one of the best shows I've seen at Irving Plaza, and I pretty much am there like three times a week, so it was a fantastic, fantastic yeah. performance. That's awesome. That yeah, that was that was super fun. We did two nights at Irving on that one. Actually, it was it was amazing. Yeah, yeah. I was only able to attend the first one, but uh, okay. And what was amazing is just the pouring rain that day. I'll never forget that. That's the reason oh, why. Yes. Another reason why I'll never forget that show. I I live walking distance from that venue, and I practically had to take a jet ski there. Wow. Yeah, I do remember that day. Yeah, there was a lot of actual like literal flooding in in New York City that day. It was insane. It was insane. Yeah. But yeah, not, yeah. but not the worst. Not the worst. Uh, Soulfly no. has, has the worst flooding story. Oh yeah! Wow, that's terrible. Well, hopefully we have. I mean, we're playing Irving in April, so hopefully we don't. Uh, hopefully the spring season is kind to us and we get a nice uh, calm day. If if not, and if that isn't the case, because between the fire alarm at Gramercy Theater and uh, the flooding that day, then I'm, I'm then you guys are more metal than any behemoth or emperor or mayhem that's played in uh, New York City. Yeah, the fire alarm at Gramercy. I forgot about that. That's um, that was well. It made for some fun pictures. We took Polaroids uh, while the show was stopped, and we were like throwing dice and hitting a vape pen on stage. That's pretty awesome. Uh, which you probably shouldn't vape on stage when the fog machine is the is the thing that sets off the fire alarm. I suppose, but. <laughs> it was, uh, maybe, it was cool. maybe there there could have been some answers there to why that happened, <laughs> but yeah, no, we we do know exactly what happened, and uh, either way, it, it makes for a good story. So. It definitely does. It definitely does. <laughs> um, but it's so awesome to have you here because the last uh, new thing I heard from Intervals was uh, the new uh, single that you put out in 2023, uh, Mnemonic. Um, yeah, is this at all maybe like a good? representation of what like a full-length follow-up to circadian is going to sound like or is this just a, sort of like a one-off experimental sort of thing it is on the record um and it is in my opinion probably the best leading track from the album to sort of give listeners a taste of of what's to come i think it's pretty balanced in terms of some of the vibes that you can expect on the new record without giving too too much away i guess that's why we chose it um to sort of come out as a leading track ahead of the album um but yeah there's definitely some new stuff going on and some sharpening of the blade on some things that we've been doing um from the time of this call new music is imminent actually uh because tour starts next friday and uh we want to let everybody in on secrets so um that's all coming but uh i'd say mnemonic was a good good way to dip a toe on this new record yeah there's been such an evolution like since the space between ep to now and i feel like when you compare like just you know not only just with guitar skill but with song arrangement and with the atmosphere and just watching you guys play for so many years at this point there's always a constant evolution and that's what i love about intervals is that with every song and every album and even every show there's always evolution that's demonstrated with the making of each album do you go into it with sort of like a vision of what you want to demonstrate or sort of like a preconceived idea or is it is your songwriting process very improvisational and experimental that's a good question um i kind of have an idea laid out uh some guidelines some parameters that I kind of want to bounce around within um, when I approach new material. Sometimes more open and slightly more interpretive to myself in the early stages of the process. Sometimes I, I don't have a full grip on it. For some reason, Circadian and this latest record, um, I had a pretty um, vivid idea of, of where things were probably bound to head. Um, but I try not to set too many like hard preconceptions going in because then I, I find that uh, while some limitation is, is good for focusing ideas and, and, and sort of having a sandbox to play within, I, I think that, um, uh, you know, too much of that can, can also hamper the vision. So 
yeah, I don't know. Like it's a ba- it's a fine line between trying to leave thing leave the door open for myself, but also knowing sort of like where to kind of you know because option paralysis will, will sort of ensue if um, if it's too uh, open and interpretive to myself. I need to have some sort of like guardrails. So yeah, I, f- I felt like going into this this upcoming record, it was logical to continue expanding on what we did with Circadian, but I think there's it's going to be pretty evident in terms of the areas where we focus harder um, vis-a-vis sound design and the density of the overall production um, and leveling up on production in general. Yeah. Um, for, for, for those that, that follow intervals and know sort of what's been going on um, right before you saw us on that tour with Spirit Box last year and just before we, we went on our last tour of 2023 with Tesseract we had done uh, two two week stints of recording at Sweetwater in Studio A um, which is really cool because um, I mean it's it's a building filled with every piece of musical equipment known to man so you know i i think that it uh is incumbent on probably you know almost a, a, any artist who who requires a good amount of toys to make their albums to maybe consider I, you doing that you'd have a lot of problems deciding what piece of gear to use and i've already mm-hmm. seen your like guitar arsenal and like many different like because a lot of guitar players you know some of them are ibanez users or prs users or kiesel users i noticed kiesel is sort of very popular in the sort of like technical and progressive genre but i've seen that you've used many different guitars from prs to uh to schecter to many other different types so you've definitely got quite the arsenal you were probably having a field day down there well when it, so that's it's funny because when it comes to you know choosing sweet water the guitar the guitar thing i mean we also we also kind of chose it because it, it's i could drive there so that means i could bring a lot of my own stuff so i brought a hilarious amount of stuff to a place that already has all the things uh but guitars are very particular because guitars are like personality so uh we were leaning on them for everything else uh and and for those that follow as well um th- they'll know that i i have um, a signature line with with Schecter. we released the diamond series in in 2022 which um uh, was the reason I, I, I actually that was the whole Sweetwater connection was I was there for Gearfest, and I met Sean who manages the studio there, and um, it just seemed like a really good fit as far as like the people that run the show over there and they have an incredible like flagship studio with with an Eve console and access to a massive drum room and all the microphones you could ever want. So really that's that at the end of the day, like I could put all these things in cases and take them with me, but it's the stuff I don't have, which is, you know, the mojo of a, of a real, you know, recording studio with a lot of pedigree and, and a big room and a lot of toys. <laughs> so it really came down to microphone selection on the drums and, you know, pulling in some additional synths and things that, uh, you know, maybe we wanted to do some stuff in the last minute and just being able to to capture a vibe with everybody, you know, spending, I mean, between both sessions, we did, we racked up about 26 days. So having the whole group sitting around an Eve console making a record in a slightly more traditional way than, you know, everybody multi-tracking independent of each other was kind of really more so what we were after there. And, you know, I brought too many damn guitars and it was awesome we used a lot of stuff and uh and uh, did some reamping with some cool amps and stuff like that and just you know just just taking advantage of uh, i mean because i you know i can make a great sounding production here in this room um and have it mixed by a professional or we can all get in a room together and have this sort of hybrid of the way bands would traditionally make records before the onset of modern recording um, toys and consumer level recording toys that, that do get you pretty close. There's a difference though, Well, you in me- my opinion. You mentioned like the guitar is a personality and whatnot and I wanted to get into that actually because I feel like an interval song in itself is a personality of its own as well. Yes. So like yes. when you, but at the same time like the way that you have all these different chord progressions and all these different notes that you're incorporating in there, I feel like 
the emotion almost fluctuates. I feel like you you create movement with melody in an interval song. So yeah. has the sort of like, if you could, if it, it was possible, would you almost like switch out guitars in the middle of a song even to almost be like, because I feel like your songs grow in its personality in itself. Your songs have that type of life in it. Sure, yeah. Um, when it comes to recording, no, it's, it's I mean, there's there's some stuff, there's, there's room for, for sort of calling audibles and doing some things that are maybe on the fly or a little bit more spontaneous. Those tend to be more like the icing or sprinkles though. Um, when it comes to making professional rock and metal records, I think that it's probably more prudent to use a couple of things that do jobs really, really well and use that as the foundation. So there's less variety in the early stage where you know we might relegate one guitar per tuning for rhythm and if it's intonating well and it's in tune and it sounds banging and it's playing good then that's probably the one that's going to do the heavy lifting on all of the rhythms or whatever so a little less creative in that capacity but definitely taking the time early on to figure out like which blade is the sharpest you know what i mean and uh and then from there stylizing individual parts when it comes to overdubs mm -hmm. is where all the guitars will come into the mix. We have a studio doc that's actually going to start dropping in installments over the course of the the release campaign as well. So awesome. I think we'll be able to like kind of see a lot of that. Um, is but yeah, no, we'll, we'll, we'll reach for very, you know, it might need some a part might need to feel like a strat or we want to get some really twangy overdubs. So we use a Gatelli, you know, or we'll reach for something else in the collection that has like a really unique voice or something like that for a particular lead, what, what have you, you know, but that's more so on top of the foundation. Yeah. yeah. Well, cause when the interval song has so much emotion behind it is everything we're hearing because it's very technical what you play and it, you know there's a lot of you know a lot of gearheads resonate with your music and i see just as many people looking at your uh, looking at the pedal board or your guitar arsenal as yeah. when you're on stage but sure. the, the music in itself is very easy to get lost in is what we're hearing almost a reflection of a particular emotion or experience that you were feeling in a way or is intervals more of an escapism in a way where like you're not bringing too much of your own personal life into it i mean there is a famous saying we are what we create or every painting is a self-portrait but like do you almost feel like we get lost in our music i would go to an intervals concert to escape from reality so is it sort of like a similar experience for you when you're writing this material it's kind of both um I think it would be impossible to not say that some sort of lived experience or some sort of like personal, you know, sort of allusion towards something is happening when I'm channeling like a given idea or whatever, but it's kind of like a balance between reacting in the moment, like, you know, start sketching an idea and then, you know, given chord progression or a riff has me feeling inclined to say something over top. Or, or what have you, and um, how I express myself is, is, is sort of a balance between sort of what I'm hearing intuitively and where the, the brain and the hands are pulling me towards versus maybe like a particular emotion or a thought that I'm trying to evoke. It's largely interpretive considering it's instrumental. So it's sort of tough to quantify that sometimes. Um, you know, I get asked often how you like how, how I would name songs and things like that. And I think that that kind of dovetails into this a little bit because I tend to write up a, a, a composition no holds barred and I can't really decide on what or who it wants to be until like the until it's almost done and it's telling me I kind of like finish a piece and then I like let it tell me what it's called. You know what I mean? Which is kind of interesting. I, I, I have, I'll probably have a silly working title and like I have a vague idea of like maybe where this thing is going. But until I can like complete it and take it for a walk and absorb it like the listener, where I'm not, you know, tracking every moment and scrutinizing little bits and, and the minutiae that people don't like, really hear or care about. It's a uh, I need to hear it and let it tell me. And then I get to be, I'm just lucky that I get to be the one who pens what it's called. Well, yeah. it's funny. I think it's almost like a trend with instrumental music. They'll, you'll take like the most intricate, emotional, atmospheric, beautiful song, and it'll be called something like, I think I ate too much shrimp this morning. Or something. <laughs> I t that's crazy. Yeah. I, so there are some artists that tend to do this well. Those tend to die in the working title stage. Um, but I uh, I don't know. I mean, well, while, while I do, I do 
uh, have a proclivity towards like maybe keeping things like a little bit more, I don't want to say too serious. Uh, I definitely don't take things that seriously. So there is some humor in, in some things. I, I kind of like, uh, I'm into plays on words. I thought so, I thought the opening track off Circadian was I, I with my dyslexia. I thought it was saying five FDP like five finger death punch or something. Oh like wow, that. that's but no. but like you're right. Like with a track like Dose with the abbreviation behind it, but like Signal yeah. Hill or Earthing like that has like a unique sort of like that creates its own little world in itself. Yeah, and they all definitely have syntax. I mean, anybody who's familiar with the intervals lore might be more equipped to maybe navigate like where some of those things are coming from. Um, I struggle to name songs and commit to song titles without an actual reason. I am not here for arbitrary words for for no reason, and I think that sometimes maybe there there gets to be some of that. Maybe there's a, that assumption based on how some of this stuff kind of presents, um, especially because an instrumental artist doesn't typically have the medium in which to tell their fans why or how. So I do my best to where where possible to try to talk about that, whether it's through written uh, dissertation of, of you know a track by track when an album comes out, um, or, or through, through through the press medium like this or whatever. But you know, a song like Earth Thing is actually like there's a thematic callback to a song from the, the Way Forward called The Waterfront. So because they're like a sequel, a sequel sort of like Earthing is sort of the like, it's like part two of like, you know, if the waterfront is like feet in the water, well then Earthing is like the return to shore type thing, right? And, 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 there, and there, is, there is a melodic motif that actually connects them. Um, you know, whereas like DOPES, the acronym is, is dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, endorphins, and 5-HTP, the first track on Circadian, they are actually linked with a melodic motif as well, 5-HTP being the uh, molecular precursor to serotonin in the body. So there's like a, a link there between those as well. Um, you know, and then I also, like I mentioned, I, I like a play on words. Just before we got on this call, I was just practicing, we're playing a song from the way forward for the first time on this tour we've never debuted live it's called rubicon artist and you know like that is like a, a a thing that i'll fall back on sometimes if i i don't have a full perhaps description or reason for why a song is what it is and it's just invoking an emotion maybe i'll just play off of some sort of cheeky you know li literary illusion or something like that so you know like crossing the rubicon and con artist yeah. smash together you know so like i'm i'm i'm, I'm kind of down to keep it light and not necessarily always have like a super highly in-depth reason for stuff more often than not though there is definitely some sort of allusion to other motifs within the catalog and trying to connect pieces for people who care about those types of things or even if it's just to have a really consistent and solid sort of like through line concept or syntax on a given song or whatever. Do you feel um, I'll make sure that's present. With the soloing that you incorporate, because even though it's an instrumental band, I feel like your guitar solos do pretty much a similar thing that what vocals and even lyrics are supposed to do with conveying that emotion and even that concept. So when it comes to yeah. tracking and laying down different solos, is it better to have uh, like sort of like background music presence so you know what key or form to work in or do you kind of come up with the solo first and then the rest of the music would kind of like build around that for a solo no there's definitely going to be a company accompaniment first for a top line melody or something that functions more like the identity of a song or a hook or something that can sometimes exist in a vacuum without um accompaniment it's probably more common though that the the, the canvas happens before the paint you know uh the rare time that melody happens the other way around where the sort of you know you have paint with no canvas is like is is very rare zero gravity environment it's very rare so you know what i mean uh i i tend to have the canvas first so i have something to paint on i guess but but sometimes sometimes you just have a color in a bucket you know what i mean but you you, you need to figure out where to put it you know so and that's the that's the beauty of harmony is that you can have a melody that sounds very innocuous all by its lonesome and you can hand that to six different musicians and the way that they sort of approach a chord progression or 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 create that canvas behind it is like largely interpretive it's kind of like shining different lights on on an object and getting a different vibe every every time so yeah i kind of uh i kind of bounce back and forth between both but but it more often than not the composition is is, is starting with some sort of progression 
or I love starting songs with riffs because a riff is like a microcosm of ideas. There is an underlying chord progression, then there is some sort of top line melody or some sort of voice leading component. And if you break them apart from each other, te- a lot of the time you can have the melody and the chords independent of each other, and that gives you the ability to spread that out over the timeline. Then you have the pieces of a song. So I tend to look at it that way as well, but every song's different. So. Do you think, because every band I've interviewed, and I've interviewed black metal bands, death metal bands, metalcore, hard rock, like in every single band, and, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing, everybody has their own method, but like every band says, yeah, it usually starts off with a riff. Will we ever run out of riffs one day? <laughs> That's, yeah, well, I think, and I think to, to, to go back to my previous point, I think that like the riff is such a, is, is such a, a miniature sort of, yeah, a microcosm. It's like a seed that wants to be watered. It contains like so much DNA, you know, from like, you know, the way a, a given rock or metal artist approaches, approaches a riff, it could be as straight ahead and basic and on the nose and catchy and fun and just like there's no room to interpret or think the listener knows exactly how it, you know and then you look at uh, some you know more heady type stuff um think animals as leaders think the contortionists think periphery think you know more bands think, think test rack there is like a sonic fingerprint that ha- that you know some traits that are unique to the to that artist or whatever some moves or you know there's definitely like a proclivity towards like certain types of techniques and things like that and that that's what that's what gives you know every artist their sort of unique sound when it comes to that and i think as a result like you know the riff is 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 kind of something that is a trope that will happen forever in, in rock and metal i mean even look at modern electronic music oh absolutely. you know what the, the with the with the yeah the advent of you know i mean it's I think we're over a decade now since like the big first dubstep wave but i think that that struck everybody as like the electronic version of metal riffs yeah no and 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 it's it's it, it you know it's it's never gonna get old no it, it never is i think riff and and there's so many ways to express it one of my favorite personal favorite guitar players is dino from fear factory and he is yeah, very sure. very riff driven he's not doing Ingve malmsteen like or uh, aaron marshall like soloing if you will but the riffs in itself <laughs> play to the comp- uh, composition. but And then sure. there's soloing that's incorporated in your end. But what I'm curious about is because you're soloing, again, it captures that moment and it captures that energy. But you know, if you're working on a song, the craftsmanship, there's a lot of precision involved and you have to take your time with it. But do you find it maybe the longer that you work on this material, the harder it is to sort of maintain the initial spark of the idea? Wow, crazy question. Um, no because if i'm if i'm you know very vivid and of conviction with 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 where the project is headed so so to go back a few questions like if i've set some quality guidelines or i've built a sandbox that i'm going to play in um as long as i'm passionate about those parameters i don't feel that way but if I again, if I if I if I'm leaving things open ended, or I'm not sure what exactly what it is that I want to say, then yeah, I, I can I can sort of like lose the plot to to a degree. Um, but I feel like every time I put out a release, the roadmap is already sort of laid out in front of me because I'm a perfectionist and I just always want to do better and I just want to keep going and I'm still very hungry to do this and not over it in the slightest. So I kind of like put out a body of work and then immediately like, no, okay, these are all the places where I think I can improve or, oh, we did a good job at saying this or we started to kind of like scratch the surface of this one idea. Like, let's take that and sort of expand further. I'm always finding like wormholes. Well, you know, so. well, I've noticed you like to go back to certain things, like what you said uh, with the songs off of Circadian, kind of like paying tribute to like a previous or being a sequel. You also go back a couple of questions throughout the course of this interview. So I've noticed that maybe you do like kind of going in multiple directions. That's almost kind of just how you function as an artist in a way, not moving in one specific direction, but always taking an element from the past, not forgetting the past, which I think is great because for me, like, 
for some of my favorite bands where they completely neglect the past or don't want to address yes. the past. Or even in yes. movies where they like, you know, they only, in movies when you have like the fifth edition of this movie, but they only keep talking about the first and not the two, <laughs> the first two or something like that. Um, and, you know, Scream was very guilty of that until recently. But like, I feel like that that's a really intricate way that you're working. I'm just getting that not only from watching you play, but just talking to you now. Yeah, I, th- I think... Uh... Well, I'm a basket case, so there's that. Well, you but, have to uh, be in this industry, you know. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. So um, I don't know. I think that uh, I have a hard time. Uh, well, there's two. There's two things. I think the calling card of any musician with a very um, distinct identity is one that features like the remnants of previous ideas i think that that matters it's inclusive to the listener it's not by design but i think the ones that 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 do that are the ones that that are building more of a comprehensive world that all of the music lives in and it's inclusive to the listener because when they find those easter eggs or they hear something or whatever they know it's you right um it's also a, a tip of the hat to your previous material, and it's also it also I think justifies and further underscores the the, the decision making process. There, like it, it kind of like justifies ideas by saying like, no, this wasn't just like a one off thing I got lucky with in the moment. This is an idea or a rut that the hands are in, or a thing that you know, like we obviously don't want to overuse those things, but like showing your hand to be like, yeah, no, it's me, like. You know, this is this is I have a let go of this thought. Like this is something I still want to tell you about or remind you about, mm. like uh, or myself in the composition. You know that like matters. I think, and I think it goes a long way. Um, I also think that this is a concept that that sort of functions within the in in, in the in the realm of, of songwriting. Is that especially with music like this that has no vocal. Um, I think it really matters and it goes a long way with listeners to have a composition compositional approach that feels inclusive mm. um music is about contrast so you're constantly switching elements so you know there's there's micro macro ways to look at it within solos you know typically you want to swing the pendulum from you know let's say dense fast phrasing to something that's a little bit more drawn out or syncopated or whatever like that's like a a, a subtle but but still a, a, a tangible swing of the pendulum. In songwriting, the same thing happens whether it's pop music or metal music. You look at how a song is structured, the bridge perhaps is the opportunity to give a different perspective. Now you can have full balls to the wall songs that hold people's attention, but some of the best songs have a good arc and an ebb and a flow to them. And that's because the human mind finds contrast to be interesting. Yeah. Right? Well, no, absolutely. So, absolutely. And, and you yeah. Know, uh, you led me perfectly into what I wanted to talk, uh, also wanted to talk about, and that is I okay. have a few more questions for you because this year is an important year for Intervals as it marks yeah. ten years of a voice within. So, paying tribute to earlier material and looking at it now, how would you say that that has evolved over the years? Do you think that the meaning of it has changed after putting out, you know, the Shape of Color and uh, the way forward and now? I believe that. It wasn't very definitive for intervals. And I actually believe that that was, wow, maybe of conviction in the moment, it was the most, let's try something. It was the least like, here it is. It was the most, let's try something. The Escape and is still I, one of my favorite songs. So. I think, oh, I'm very proud of that record and I love it dearly. And I still think that it holds like a, a very strong place in the, in, the, in the timeline for intervals. But if anything, it was kind of the thing to juxtapose everything else against to say this was a thought early on let's explore it and it didn't necessarily pan out you know maybe how some of us had thought but if anything what it does is it reminds me about my earliest convictions which was making instrumental music and being very passionate about leading the composition with you know what i what i think personally is the most honest way for me to express myself within the confines of this music. If you look at the space between and in time, I think that that's evident that that's what was happening beforehand. Um, funny enough, if you look at the lighter notes, uh, either with both of those or one of them, all well, the space, space between never existed physically. Um, aside from maybe a few CDs. I can't remember where we'd put it now. It's been a while. 
But I wrote a note inside the the liner notes that said that I hadn't ruled out the idea of whether or not the project would maybe feature vocals in time at some point. Night versus and, took the opposite route. They started with the vocals and now they're staying instrumental. And we and we met in 2014 on the tour where A Voice Within came out and we were touring together and Doug was singing for them and Mike was singing for us. And absolutely, I just stayed with Nick uh, surrounding Nam. Still very close friends. Love those guys. Um, and... Uh, it's yeah it's it's funny because both of us were in it we're in a similar position they did start out that way and then they and then they had sort of grabbed the wheel themselves for me it was more of reverting to the thing that was the impetus in the beginning uh but i again while it while it's such a special record and yeah i mean we are we are approaching a decade of it and, and funny enough even just going into the tour we're about to start we talked about the idea of bringing back some of those compositions and maybe doing them in a way that now does them a little bit more justice and in, 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 in how, you know, uh, I mean, we've grown as the live entity, um, you know, since the Shape of Color era till now, there's been a little bit of tweaks around the edges, but for the most part, the core between Nathan and Jacob and myself has been really consistent and we definitely are the strongest iteration of the live intervals band uh, and and there's sort of like, now I think, I think about it and I, I go, you know, maybe we could pull in Moment Marauder and do an instrumental version to do it justice and um, and play a little bit more top line over top of the composition and really draw a, a straight line through it and make it make sense. At the same time, those songs were never really composed for that. So I have, a, I'm of two minds when it comes to that. It has the instrumentation that I've loved from, you know, onward, but with the vocals incorporated sure. in there, I think it also shows that there is dipping the toe in the water. Like I thought Mike's vocals on there was actually pretty uh, expressive in itself. And like, I, and I think that that played a role in it, but also at the same time, this isn't to criticize vocalists at all, but there is something limiting about having a vocalist, whether it's you have to maybe adjust your tuning to fit what their vocal capabilities are. You are True. surrendered in terms of composite, unless you're a, like a very, very, very like progressive, like, you know, like yes or porcupine tree, but like you have sort of like a verse chorus sort of structure you have to follow. So I think like it has a great representation of potential and how we would see the instrumentation evolve. But I think the vocals there were also a good they were a good voice to narrate us, you know what I mean? It was like the opening to a documentary. For sure. And I think that, you know, everybody that was involved in the making that record um, worked really hard and did a great job. I'm still exceptionally proud of it. I also absolutely had a hand in, you know, producing the vocal melodies and um, also Cam McClellan, who used to play bass for Protest the Hero and has now moved on to, he's tour manager in front of house for Daniel Caesar and make Jesse Reyes and doing all kinds of stuff. But um, yeah, um, I, I, I feel like, you know, it was a, it was a fine line to, to ride at the time because we knew that we were pivoting away from the precedent that was set with the, with the prior EPs. Uh, but for me, the challenge was like, let's, you know, I prioritized the vocals over any of my guitar leads. We left that last in the composition, which is completely counter to how the music was forming prior and how it's evolved since that record. But to me, it was always paramount that I don't color in too much uh, in advance. I, I want to leave that room open to make the vocals obviously function the way that they're supposed to. But then the idea was to then write as many lines that could support my, whether it's through harmony or counter lines that sort of support what the main vocal is doing and then also break from that into being, you know, more traditional mm, yeah. guitar lead type stuff with solos and things of that nature. And it was cool, man. It really did kind of like, I think, show people that, yeah, it's it's certainly, um, you know, possible to hear from intervals. Have not ruled out some collaborative projects or one-offs or things like that in the future. Could be a fun thing to do. Um, I, I'm certainly uh, open-minded to it. I think we're a long way away from that now to where it's less confusing. I think it was more important to me afterwards once we had made a conscious decision to revert to being, you know, embracing the instrumental sound and just growing from that point on. It was very important to me to just like let that be by the wayside and to lean into w what it is that I'm trying to do. I mean, now we're going into our, going into our fourth LP since then. 
um, fully instrument, which is actually kind of nuts. There's the two EPs, then there's a voice within, and then there's now uh, this new record will make four instrumental um, LPs since that time. So, um, you know, it, it's uh, it's a feather in the cap, uh, and I love it. And it is cool that we're, that uh, we are approaching, or we you know we're a decade of of ABW is imminent, and, and that's and that's totally cool. Um, it's great to see like how how these bands have evolved. I remember when like yeah. Polyphia, they didn't have a singer at all and they've been incorporating more vocals into their sound now while yeah. also maintaining that. And you I remember when they were freaking playing like, you know, a very, very tiny room. You know, you look at Jason Richardson, he just uh left um I think he was just leaving Chelsea Grin at that time. So yeah. or uh, uh the year after after they put out Ashes to Ashes. So like it almost seemed like Everybody, you having your trial and error with the vocals on the voice within, you know, yep. Jason Richardson kind of exiting the deathcore world and kind of going into his sort of thing. It almost seemed like it was starting to form. I felt the scene sort of like, and not I felt the scene, but you were able to sort of feel the scene sort of like coming together in that regard. 100%. Yeah, a lot's, a lot's changed. A lot is the same. Yeah. Um, but... Yeah, I think since I th at that time, you know, 2015 and on, um, was when things really kind of took shape and yeah. look and feel the way they, they are now, which is, uh, in my opinion, the strongest live representation of, um, you know, how the band is intended to, 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 to feel and sound live. And we're starting to really kind of coming into our own now, I think, on record as well, you know, um, which is... Which is crazy uh, to be that many albums in and starting to feel like, oh, this is the sound. Um, but I think it's a good thing. I also don't feel like we've scratched, you know, they, we're, we're barely scratching the surface again, just with what we're doing on this new one, uh, even though I feel like it, there is an exponential level up if you uh, go on streaming and you, you jump from Circadian into this new record. I think that it's gonna be evident that, wow, there's a big leap forward uh, you know, like you see it in the tech world, you know, every time we get a new phone, it's smaller and crazier and more powerful or whatever it is. Soon I the new tech is going to be, soon the new tech is going to be no phone. It's just like, no like, phone. like, like, like here's Here. the new product. How great is that? Yeah. I mean, we, we definitely, uh, there's a few factors I think that contributed to that, but we, we really started to hone it in this time. So, uh, I'm already scheming for the next one, but yeah. for one thing at a time now, we're, we're, we're pretty close to letting everybody in on what's about to come. So hell yeah. And I uh, got time for one more question. Sure. Yep. Yeah. And that is, uh, going back to your inspiration because you seem to have a really creative mind and a really creative heart that is tr a trend that is evident in intervals in order to get that inspiration, the creative energy, if you will, do you like seek that out? Do you go looking for it? Do you have kind of like a usual place you go to to cultivate ideas or does it just strike you? Um, I tend to, um, when it's time to kind of like sort of do that sort of recon and figure out like, okay, like what's exciting me right now? What, what do I want to say next? I tend to go backwards and listen to the stuff that got me excited about music in the first place. So, you know, Spotify, my Spotify, like, you know, recent playlist or whatever would look way different. Uh, it, it tends to be, after a new record comes out, it, it tends to be, what's new? You know, I'm now getting caught up on everything that, that's new. And then when I'm writing, it's like, it looks like I'm just an absolute mess because I'm, I'm back in like 2004, I'm in 2008, I'm, I'm listening to, you know, stuff that, that, that got me excited when maybe some nostalgic records from when I started touring and was listening to music in the van and stuff like, you know, these, these things all largely like remind me of like what got me really excited. So, you know, I, I'll be going back to everything from like, classic strung out records and other like fat records bands and listening to like a lot of like, you know, punk rock and stuff that got me really amped when I was like in high school and stuff, Pennywise, strung out, bad religion, anti-flag, like just like all kinds, AFI, um, you know, this, that's the kind of stuff that really got me going early on. 
And then I did develop a taste for some of the more poppier stuff as well. So I do love uh, a newfound glory or a story of the year or any and stuff like that too. So like I'll, I'll totally get it back in on stuff like that. And it really does kind of like remind me of where some of my like melodic tendencies come from, um, you know, as well as, um, you know, maybe some of the more seminal progressive records that got me excited about playing a little bit more as well. Um, Death of a Dead Day by Sixth. Um, Sound Awake by uh, Carnival. Um, Great band. You know, albums from that time period, um, which were, these are records that are way out of the top. Controller by Misery Signals. Oh my God. Um, yes. Thank you. That's one of my favorite albums of all time. Yeah. So thank you for setting that up. Goated and way ahead of its time. Um, uh, Don't Get Lost in Movement by The Fully Down, uh, which is a, a relatively obscure, uh, like almost progressive pop punk mm-hmm. band from Canada. Um, you know, just like stuff like that. I, but then also in a lot of electronic music um, as well that kind of like intrigued me about that sound from the early days, like the the original Skrillex EP, Scary Monsters and Nice Sprites, like that, that one, I mean, just... There's just so much melodic gold on there. Like, I think everyone was enamored by, like, these big, giant, wompy sounds and the riffs and stuff. Funny, we're talking about dub stuff again. That's weird. Um, but, uh, yeah, there's a bunch of, like, places that Sonny goes melodically that, like, really spoke to me back then. Um, a lot of the early seminal, like, Deadmau stuff, because I, I, I was really starting to appreciate how much space Joel leaves in a, in a song. And there's something so restrained about that style of electronic music compared to the busy, crazy, sporadic thing that I do. Um, I, I really appreciate that. And then um, there's just some really strong standout records that have always sit, you know, uh, like once I really started to um, uh, take the intervals thing seriously, there's some stuff that re- like is I always come back to. Um, which is, um, uh, I forget the name of the record constantly, which sucks because it's it's really a really important one, but it's the seminal record from Churches. It's the one that has the mother we share on it. It's the red album cover. I, I forgot the uh, name, but I know which one you're talking about. I, yeah. I always forget the name of the record for some strange reason. But yeah, so like I always go back to that. And um, um, also there's a record from Purity Ring that I forget the, the name of as well. She's like floating on the cover. It's the one that has like Begin Again and all that stuff on it. Those albums really, uh, really left an impact on me as far as like the sonic palette of this like really deep, heavy electronic sound with this like beautiful top line happening at all times. Like Church is a little less heavier. It's like a little bit more of the like almost like believable like rough around the edges like putting a like putting a vhs in it's got that like synth wave sound to it which i really like whereas like the purity ring, purity ring sound is more like surrealist to me where it's like it's massive and huge and heavy but her, her vocal is so delicate and the top line is so perfect at all times like there's not a single note choice there's not a single melody uh, or, or 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 you know a uh, voice leading note or whatever in, in any melody that's out of place to me like these are the things that that i always go back to um I probably miss a few more really important albums to me. Uh, Don't Take Friendship Personal by Amber Lynn. I always go back to that record for some weird reason. You got great um, fucking taste, s- man. I think out of s- all s- the, all, all, out of all, I've done over 1,800 interviews. You win the award for the best uh, taste so far. So. <laughs> oh, wow. I wanted to mention actually, so for, for, the, for, for those who, who aren't familiar as well, like, because I bring this up record up whenever I can because like if we're getting into this conversation and I can put some people on I always do but say hello to sunshine by Finch a largely yes, on record. yes 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 oh my god yes, ink so. that song ink I remember hearing that in burnout in burnout uh the uh, for PSP and just like going nuts every time that song of uh, uh, fireflies a uh, peace of mind you so to bring that back and, and like you're saying to go back in the conversation Ink and Fireflies was the first time I ever heard a band use the same motif in two songs. And there is a riff that happens in Ink and in Fireflies yep. that it's boom, dead, boom, dead, just this like quick little thing that happens. It happens in both songs. And I remember the when as soon as my brain clocked it, I had to go to the other song and find it and go, am I losing my mind or did they do that? Because I had never heard a band. I thought it was completely taboo 
to to repeat yourself not not within a song but like within multiple songs to like act, like wholeheartedly reach in and say here's a piece from that and just drop it in and it it blew my mind like everything that i knew about like the rules of writing music were completely shattered <laughs> at that moment, let alone that album is way ahead of its time, incredible compositions and stuff. So anyway, I always throw that in there. We were talking, we're getting excited about old music. I forgot to just throw that in yeah. there. So. <laughs> yeah, well, for real, thank you. And if I didn't have another interview in like uh, three minutes, I would totally uh, want to continue this story. Okay. I never get, okay. finally, somebody mentioned Finch and uh, whoever's watching this, if you know the guys in Finch and can get them on the show, that would be awesome. Uh, but thank you so much. Is there just some, anything else with intervals? I know that you got the upcoming tour with uh, Hell of Sun, I believe. Is there just uh, new music coming soon? Anything you'd like to plug? Just feel free that you're allowed to talk about at this moment. Yeah, well, new, new music on the eve of tour. Potentially, who knows? Um, and um, there's a whole new record, and there's lots in the pipeline. Um, co-headliner with Hail the Sun, um, kicking off March eighth, and wrapping up mid-April, all through North America. Um, uh, there's a bunch of major market Canadian cities that are going to burn me for that one. Um, through largely through the entire United States, and there is a Montreal and Toronto show. So sorry, Canada. Uh, we'll uh, we'll we'll be back. Um, so yes, so that's coming up, and then we are supporting Mammoth WVH for nine shows in May. So we're doing uh, step in a little outside of the prog realm and into the rock world, which is really cool, and we're really excited about that. So it's just intervals in Mammoth, um, and that kicks off um, in early early May. That is a great uh, tour for you guys to be on because how many diehard Eddie Van Halen fans who like watching him shred? Not, I mean, no offense, nobody could be Eddie Van Halen, but like, uh, course, I think, I think that this will give Eddie Van Halen fans who miss him so dearly a lot more hope, knowing that there's still people who freaking kill it on the guitar uh, and people who take inspiration. I think you are going to really speak to their fans. I think it's cool. Wolfie's been amazing and and just like you know, just very genuine friendly character and just a great guy and i i love his records and and what he's doing so we're really excited about that so yeah head co-headliner with hail the sun coming up literally starts in just over a week and then we'll be running around with mammoth there's a brand new record keep your eyes and your ears out for new music and a music video and an album announced and all that stuff it's all coming soon so uh, yeah, appreciate your time. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate you, man. Everybody, we are here with Aaron Marshall of Intervals. New stuff coming very soon. We'll see you next time on Heavy New York.